We are in for a treat today, everybody. Hi, my name is Mary David with IDA TV, and I am joined by the legendary, best-selling author, award-winning comic book editor, documentary producer, pop culture historian, activist, actor, and singer, Andy Mangles. Andy, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here, Mary. Thank you for uh, for having me and for for all those accolades. It's. <laughs> I've had, a, I've had a, a really all over the place career. You are so incredibly talented and have produced work in, in so many different fields. I want to start with talking about Star Wars. There have been thousands of books written about Star Wars, but the one that you wrote in 1995, The Essential Guide to Characters, made the USA Times bestseller list. How do you write about a subject that's been told so many times before in a way that's new and fresh like you did? Well, it's it at that point in time when I worked on the Essential Guide to Characters book, it was the world of Star Wars wasn't as developed as what they've done now. And they they knew that they were going to be developing it. So the book that I wrote and the books that followed it by other authors were essentially a way for them to say, what is everything we have so we can now build on it from there? And it really, it was not only for the fans, it was also for Lucasfilm itself to kind of take stock of where their characters were and to take stock of where their history was and their canon and, and so forth. And, um, you know, now there is, there is so much Star Wars out there that it's really difficult to keep track of. Uh, so people really need something like that. But, but when I wrote that book, the internet wasn't around. And there wasn't a way for people to quickly Wikipedia something or Google it or something like that. They really needed a book like mine to kind of keep track of everything. Well, that was a very modest answer on your part, Andy, but this is not the only time you've been on the bestseller list. What do you do in your research and planning of your work that sets your stories apart from others in the same genre? Well, I think there is, there's an interesting thing that happens between comics and, and Hollywood. And in the comic book world, the more you're a fan of something, oftentimes the editors will kind of shy away from you because sometimes you know the, the subject or the character better than they do. Or they're afraid that you'll that you won't be flexible with the with you know what they want for the characters, and with some writers that's true. Uh, Hollywood tends to be the opposite of that, where they want to find the people with the most amount of knowledge, so that they have to do as little work as possible behind the scenes to to, to fix things up. So the books that I do, uh, the Star Trek books and X Files and Iron Man and and all this stuff. Uh, one of the things I've become really uh, famous for and, and work really hard at is making sure that everything that I do comes from a place of fandom uh, and, and excitement, but that it also is footnoted to death for behind the scenes. So nobody can ever come back and say, well, where'd you get that information? Or what, what is that from? Or where's this character from? Or things like that. Because they know I've done my research. And that helped, you know, when I was doing documentaries for DVD sets, and when I've been doing magazine articles and things like that, my whole career has always been about uh, making sure the details are correct. Because if you make sure the details are correct, then you can kind of let your imagination go from there. Mm, well, and maybe this answers my question a little bit, but I'm curious about in that process, you have people who are avidly interested in these topics, but how do you set yourself as apart from being not just a hobbyist, but taking it to that next level and, and really becoming a professional in the craft that's sought after the way that you are? It was a, a, a little bit easier in, uh, you know, in the days before the internet, because now there's so much of that, uh, that work is being done on the internet by fans and people are setting up their own wiki pages and 
people uh, you know have fan pages for whether it's a tv show or a character or things like that so there's really easy ways to kind of become an expert on a topic in today's uh internet world um so in the past when lucasfilm was really you know for instance when i did the star wars book lucasfilm was really looking for somebody like me and was having a difficult time finding it now they might have an easier time because they'll they they would just do some internet searches find some people who had good web pages and maybe hire them um so i i think that for those people who who want to pursue a field like this it's uh, it kind of depends on what angle you want to go. If you want to work in Hollywood, then see if there's a way to intern. Um, if there's a way to be a PA on a set or to be an assistant to somebody or something like that, uh, and, because you have to work your way up. I didn't start out writing a best-selling Star Wars book. I started out writing articles for $10 a piece, you know, and after uh 10 years of doing that then i got the star wars book and um and it took 30 years for me to get to write wonder woman meets the bionic woman which was my dream job you know <laughs> so it's not it's not a quick process you and you have to put in a lot of work and you have to prove that you as uh as a writer have both the uh the information uh, that you need to write, especially when you're writing licensed properties, but you also have to have imagination on top of that. You can't just come in and go, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, mm -hmm. if that doesn't work for their, um, for their property. I'll give you a, like a really specific thing without, without like jumping all the way down the road. But for instance, uh, star trek has alternate realities that's built into star trek there's the mirror universe there's other realities there's the movie the new movie universe etc and star wars doesn't um or hasn't really had that as baked into its dna so if you go to the star wars people and you say i want to do an alternate reality star wars story it's not going to be uh accepted as much as if you did that with star trek and uh you know time travel is another thing the the same type of thing there's no time travel in star wars to speak of uh whereas there is in star trek so uh you have to really kind of you can't just be an imaginative person or just be a good writer when you're working in other people's realms you have to know their realms that makes so much sense. As far as knowing these realms so well, where did your passion for comics, for all of this begin? I grew up in a little town in Montana called Big Fork and a population of, uh, I think, less than 2,000. Uh, our nearest neighbor was half a mile away. One mile away, by the way, was Dirk Benedict, who was on Battlestar Galactica. He oh, lived a mile wow. away from me. Um, but, and I was I li was literally on a mountain and as a kid being introduced to comic books and then in the library, I would read every bit of mythology and science fiction and horror and anything I could find in that realm, I would devour it. And because it was a way for me to explore the world beyond what I had around me. Uh, Montana was beautiful and there was nature and we lived on a lake and a mountain and, you know, there was all this lovely nature, but there wasn't spaceships and there wasn't people flying and there wasn't cities and, uh, and something that, that interestingly became a part, big part of my career is diversity. There wasn't diversity in Montana. It was, uh, I did not see people of color other than occasionally Latino or Native Americans. And um, I longed for that. I would see things on TV and I would read books and comics and so forth. And I'd be like, I want to know about the world around me. And I want to know about the worlds beyond our world. And 
comic books were kind of the most exciting way to do that because it was a combination of pictures and words and also uh, they could be any genre. Wow, I love how you have really combined all of these different spaces and, and, and made it your own too, but also made it so accessible. You're on the board of PRISM, a nonprofit supporting the LGBTQIA friendly comic books, comic professionals, readers, and educators. And I'd love to hear more about how you got involved and what sparked that and why you wanted to be part of that. Back in 1987 and 1988, I uh, wrote an article for Amazing Heroes magazine called Out of the Closet Into the Comics. And I became the first openly gay comic book creator in the mainstream field. There were people in the underground comics field, but not in the mainstream field. And at that point, I really made it kind of a mission. I did that year uh, in 1988, did the, did the world's first gays in comics panel at San Diego Comic-Con. And uh, I made it, thank you. It's still going. This is this year was our 34th year. Incredible. And, uh, and it is now the longest running comic book panel in, in world history. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and uh, I, I made it kind of a mission to say the fear and the concern and the, the pushback that I am getting in my career, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen for other people. And so I really worked hard. I edited gay comics for eight years, which was an anthology, and I made it... Uh, 50% uh, men, 50% women. I invited transgender creators and creators of color to contribute in a, in a very meaningful way. I, I uh, would do this Gays and Comics panel and then started publishing kind of a zine about queer creators as more and more came out of the closet. And then eventually helped co-found Prism Comics as a way to say, we have an organization which supports not only uh, LGBTQI uh, professionals, but also the fans and the books. And PRISM is, is really a clearinghouse of, you know, if you want to know something about this field uh, from the queer perspective, here's where you go to, go to look. And... Um, it's been astonishing for me in over the 34 years, and I know that's long before you were born, <laughs> but in those 34 years, not just watching how the world outside the comic book realm has changed, but watching how the world inside the comic book realm has changed, and, and seeing that all those things that, that uh, myself and some of the other early pioneers in the field couldn't even dream of you know the, the the idea that marvel and dc would do pride anthologies was not even something that we could conceive of yeah. you know that that was that wasn't even on the bucket list <laughs> because it would never happen i mean 34 years ago marvel had a policy that there were no gays in the marvel universe it was a policy and DC would not use certain words. They, they wouldn't use the word lesbian, you know. Um, and now they're putting out pride anthologies. So to see those, uh, that those inroads are now superhighways, you know, and yeah. that, that many of today's top books are being written by openly LGBTQI creators is, um, is really, uh, it's gratifying. It's, I, I'm, you know, really touched to have been a part of that journey for many people. And, um, you know, it's, it's about time. It's, uh, diversity is something that we should, as comic creators and as comic fans and as genre fans, we should be supporting diversity in all its forms because we of all people know what it's like to be on the bottom of the of the pecking order you know when we were in school and we were being made fun of for what we liked 
and what we enjoyed and the things we read and the things we listened to and the things we watched. And we were picked on because of that. All of us in the comic field know that feeling. And so I feel like we should, as a, as a community, we should use the empathy that we gain from that and say, here's how people of color feel. Here's how people of differing abilities feel. Here's how LGBTQI people feel. And um, we should apply it towards our thinking as we, as we read these comics, as we, as we watch these movies and TV shows. Um, we should look at the things we have in common with those diverse people, not the things that keep us apart. That's so incredible and wise of you beyond our times to have that perspective. When you were deciding to embark on that journey and, and make that choice to really propel these narratives forward, given, as you said, all of the pushback and the constraints societally on doing so, what gave you that courage to step out and make that decision despite everything around you? Uh, foolishness of youth. <laughs> Um, many people, that was my dog, by the way, that was Hades. <laughs> oh, just, hi, Hades, I love dogs. <laughs> just, just made a little guest appearance there. Um, the, you know, many, many queer people uh, in their journeys have, have come to that point where they're, where they, they start to realize that enough is enough. I'm done hiding. I'm done spending this energy to keep the truth hidden and away from others. And, um, you know, the, I was 20, 21 when all this happened. And um, 34 years ago, there was a lot more uh, laws that we had to fight against. There was a lot more prejudice that we had to fight against. There was a lot less knowledge and and discussion out there and um i was raised in a way that taught me empathy but that also taught me that that doing what's right is sometimes more important than doing what's best for for you and uh so i think that's what really kind of kept pushing me and it's been it's been difficult you know in in the 34 years that I've done this you you can talk about and and I have had many many successes but I'll tell you the amount of doors that have been slammed in my face are are far greater than my successes and and even today there are still editors and and creators who will not accept me and who will not work with me because of their inherent prejudices and um you know and if they won't work with me they aren't going to work with other lgbtqi people and um and it's rough but we're getting we're we're making progress every day and i really see that um i really see that in the real world and in our genre world too the d diversity is uh, you know, the, the haters can say, oh, you're woke or, oh, you're whatever, you know, but, but diversity is what we are as people. And, and if it means being woke to say, hey, I'm recognizing people's inherent humanity, then, then you can call me woke all you want. <laughs> Truly, you are, you are preaching to the choir. <laughs> How have comics, as you've seen this progression, and, and clearly there, there's still areas to improve, how have comics become a source of social power and community? Well, uh, one of the things that's happened in comics that has been um, really helpful towards community building is, uh, it's been helpful towards community building to have the internet around and the ease of getting your message out there and the message of something that's drawn and written is 
a really easy message to see on the internet. Um, the internet has done lots of awful things for the comic book field itself, but in terms of community building and accessibility, uh, it's, it's really uh, helped things. There are creators out there whose work is uh, LGBTQI creators whose work is seen by millions of people every week, which is far in excess. If you added up every X-Men book out there, you would not reach the same amount that maybe Phoebe and her, and her unicorn gets, uh, or some of the other uh, LGBTQI creators out there who are creating work that is being seen as webtoons, and it's being seen as young adult graphic novels from Scholastic or other companies. Um, the, uh, the accessibility of, of their work on the internet has, has immensely changed the landscape. And it's also allowed people to not just be superheroes and science fiction, you know? Uh, it's allowed people to tell stories about their lives and about their experiences. It's allowed people to do entire stories about cats or entire stories about history or, you know, it's really diversified the medium um, out there in, in uh, subject matter. And because somebody can develop this material on the internet, and prove that it has an audience, that means publishers are now paying attention to it and saying, oh, okay, well, if this has an audience here, then it's probably gonna have an audience if we publish it. Speaking of teens and social media and, and that's impact, a lot of your work, comics, young adult graphic novels, they require this deep understanding of teens and young people, which is such a hard, tricky, confusing, <laughs> world i feel like for a lot of adults to navigate how do you stay current with the things that resonate with young audiences and what makes them tick especially when there is so much out there and it is ever changing ah uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question because it came up when i i just did six young adult graphic novels called fractured fairy tales uh, for abdo press and one of them is about a gamer girl and I will freely admit, I've never played a video game in 20 years. You know, I, I, I used to play like Pac-Man or, or things like that, like really old video games, but I'm, uh, my brain doesn't, doesn't track well with, with hand-eye coordination, video games, et cetera. So I, uh, this is where, uh, it gets back into what we were talking about earlier with knowing your your stuff and you using reference to get things right. Um, I have a teenage girl who lives right next door to me. If I have a question about what teenage girls might think that I can't figure out on my own, I can ask her. I can go on uh, in chat rooms and say, hey, I'm researching this. Um, you know, to, to find out about games, I went to several people who were gamers and I said, here's my concept. How do I make this reasonable and how do I make this work? And what words do I use or not? Can I use this word? Can I use this? Can I explain it this way? And, um, and, and, and it worked and I was able to do that uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, I was writing a Roswell book once based on the TV show Roswell, and I had a, a, I had a, a scene that had to happen on a helicopter, and I called up the helicopter, the, the flight school at our airport, the helicopter flight school, and I said, hey, I'm writing this book, I have this scene, do you have a helicopter pilot that can walk me through what would happen and how how I can make this happen. And he, he sat and explained and he says, so we would do this and then we would do this and we'd use this instrument, and, you know, et cetera. And I wrote the scene and I had people comment on the fact that it was like incredibly realistic because I had, I had done my, re I didn't just pull it out of my head or I didn't just do a 10 second wiki search. I actually went to people who this was their thing and said, tell me about that. Uh, not only did it make my book or my projects better to do that, but um, I learned something. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
And th this touches on another point as far as your process and being so thorough, but at the same time, being this true jack of all trades, writing, producing, scripting documentaries, penning columns, doing lifestyle features, acting, singing. Writers usually say they need a lot of concentrated time devoted to their craft for exactly all the reasons you're saying, but you do so much outside of that at the same time. What is your process to produce this kind of excellent work without letting all these other balls in the air fall. Oh, there's there's <laughs> there's a lot of falling balls on the floor all over the place. Uh, I just I I have to, uh, you know, any writer any any writer out there who has had any level of success will tell you if you want to write write. I mean that's the most important thing. You don't talk about it. You don't think about it. You sit down and you write. And, um, you know, one of the aspects of being somebody who is at this tier of my career instead of, you know, down here is that, that I'm able to get, get projects greenlit more on, say, uh, a springboard or a premise or a one-page description or something like that, rather than having to give them a sample chapter. They know they already know I've got a you know bookshelf full of stuff where they can go, okay, he knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah. what's the story? So I'm able to springboard things a little more. But for for time management and for those type of skills, you really have to realize that if if this is what you want to do, then you make that your priority. You don't you don't say, ah, I'm going to take tonight off and, and play video games if, you know, which is what you want out of life. Do you want to play video games out of life or do you want to have your first book out? Do you want to be holding that book and say, I'm a published author? You know, do you want to show somebody your comic or do you want to show somebody your short film or something like that? You, you figure out what is important and you spend your time in support of that. That doesn't mean you spend all your time that way, but you you allocate um, the appropriate amount of time to get things done. Being true to yourself seems to be a big part of that. And going along with that, I'm, I'm curious, do you consider yourself more a, a writer first and, and then an advocate or an activist who writes? That is an excellent question. Um, and I don't think anyone's asked me that before. The, and I, I like hitting I, on new questions. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, I'm not sure I separate the two. Um, because my career has been inextricably tied to my activism, uh, it's, it's hard to say I'm not an activist who writes. But at the same time, uh, I have learned over the years to not come in and say, I'm a gay writer who has done these books. I say, I'm a writer who's done these books. Oh, my husband just, you know, walked in. Or, you know, you find ways to say you're a gay writer in the process, or they look at your resume and see, oh, he edited gay comics, you know. And, and, and so there's ways to make that, to make that clear. Um, but I will say that, that the biggest element of activism in my work is something that I try to push other creators to do. And that is to embrace the, you know, I keep going back to this word, embrace the diversity out there. And that can be as simple as, you know, I was scripting Wonder Woman meets the Bionic Woman and had never worked with this artist before. She was, she's uh, from, uh, she's from Europe and I had not worked with her before, had not, did not, you know, didn't know what her mindset would be other than I knew I lo loved her samples and so forth. And so I was writing this in page one and two, I'm writing a crowd scene. And I was writing, make sure that there's a fat person in this scene. Make sure that there's three people of color, you know, mixed in. Make sure you've got an older person. Make sure you've got somebody in a wheelchair. Make sure, you know, et cetera. And it was, it was a way for me to say, 
uh, you know, make sure everybody feels represented when they read this. And, um, and especially on that project, when I had a, a project that was about two of the most powerful women in the 1970s, and it was set in the 1970s. So there was a, there was a lot of different thinking about how women's role in society and everything else. It was very easy for me to work that into how people acted and reacted around them and to talk about women's issues and so forth just by doing that. But then, you know, I had a character who passed and they had to go to their funeral. And instead of saying, it's just going to be, just show everyone standing around a grave. I said, this person was Jewish. They're going to be sitting Shiva. And I did all this research on what sitting Shiva meant and that they cover their mirrors and all this type of stuff. And then Wonder Woman comes into it and she gives a, a, a Jewish phrase of comfort to the, to the daughter of the person. And it was an example of, it, it didn't have to be done. It could have been just as effective a scene with people standing at a graveside, which is what you've seen thousands of times before. But when was the last time that you saw, other than in specifically Jewish movies, <laughs> when was the last time you saw a funeral scene that was sitting Shiva? Um, or people reflecting the Jewish uh style of mourning and that's the type of thing that I always say to, to other writers when you're creating characters don't just do the default the default is going to be straight white guy <laughs> Catholic upbringing possibly European mutt you know right. don't default to that it's so much more interesting if you come up with something that is going to make people go, huh, I haven't seen an Aborigine on a starship before. <laughs> you know, what that would that be like? <laughs> you know, And uh, what's it gonna be like if this person doesn't speak English and everybody's speaking English around them? Or how is this character being, you know, having a, a missing half their leg? How is that going to affect things? Um, all of those questions can come up and make really compelling and interesting characters, but not if you've just gone for the obvious. I love that. I love that you're using the power of media to really push important narratives and issues forward and, and draw forth from all of these different cultural backgrounds and perspectives and things that we are taking for granted and, and, and not utilizing the arts as a space for advocacy. As someone who is such an expert in doing that, you've also done that to harness the power of the arts to raise money for a number of domestic violence organizations. Can you share a little bit about what sparked that vision and impact? I uh, did uh, seven, eight years of uh, an event called Wonder Woman Day. And then I then I've been involved in other charity uh, stuff, you know, all throughout my my adulthood. Um, but Wonder Woman Day uh, eventually became Women of Wonder Day because it was uh, there were issues with the, you know, DC Comics and, and utilizing their character specifically and things like that. But we ended up with the help of a lot of artists and so forth, raising over $136,000 for domestic violence charities. And um, part of the reason for that was you know, I, I do have some domestic violence issues in my background and I wanted to give back to that. But I also, I wanted to do something that was emblematic of the of the character involved. Um, you know, if you're going to use a character like Wonder Woman, who is about love and honesty and peace and truth, um, the thing that, you know, might bother her the most as a character would, would be violence towards women or children. And in ways that you can't say that, you know, Superman, of course, would be against that, or Spider-Man would be against that, or, you know, whatever. But not in such a, a, a specific, um, heartfelt way. And so I wanted to use the, 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 
very female nature and energy of the character and what she represents as a way to, uh, to, to, to give hope and to give and to raise money and things like that for this cause. And it's interesting that in the movies and things like that that have, that have happened now, um, we really are seeing women embracing that empowerment that Wonder Woman can bring. And, um, and it really has become a, Wonder Woman always was a global phenomenon as a character, but for many people, she just represented a character and perhaps maybe even a slightly campy character. Um, now she really represents something that is, that is much bigger than that. And, um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen them in the shots, but I actually have Wonder Woman's bracelets tattooed on me as, as a, a, a symbol to show people uh, every day that that, that, that uh, energy is with me. I love that so much. And I try to embrace that and embody that as much as I can as a huge Wonder Woman fan and, and love that you infuse these things together. Last question for you, these upcoming works that you have on 1970s morning shows and, <laughs> uh, and horror uh horror related theater can you give us any teasers or tidbits about what what we can expect well um i uh let's see teasers uh first uh we announced this at comic-con this year but uh gay comics which this is the the final issue of it that i edited uh we're doing myself and uh, robert tripto are doing a big two volume 1400 page hardcover box set of the complete gay comics that'll be out from Fanographics uh, in uh, fall of next year, 2022. Um, so we're doing that. And I mean, historically uh, that's immense and the amount of talent that's in those pages is just mind blowing. Um, and then beyond that, I am working on, <laughs> you said horror theater, it's kind of funny people are like, what? <laughs> um, I'm working on the first in a series of books on the media of Stephen King. And the first book is going to be on all of Stephen King's theatrical plays. And people might know about Carrie the Musical and, and maybe they remember that Misery was on Broadway, but they probably don't know about The Shining the Opera or um, you know, Eyes of the Dragon or things like that. Uh, there's been an, uh, an amazing amount of Stephen King properties that have been done on stage. And so my book's going to talk a lot about that. Uh, and then hopefully down the road, we'll do some about his films and television series and so forth. I'm a big Stephen King fan. And so this is kind of a long range thing. And then uh, I continue to work regularly for Retro Fan Magazine, writing about uh, Saturday morning television. And um, so I do have several projects in the works. Another book about filmation. I wrote one, one book about filmation with Lou Scheimer. And um, so I am looking at, at another filmation book and some, uh, some other works about Saturday morning television, which uh, is, is a lot of fun. And, and I love to, having worked on a lot of these on DVD, to put them out on DVD, and worked with a lot of the professionals involved. I love being able to now be friends with the people who I grew up watching. <laughs> you know? That is the dream. But clearly took a lot of time and effort and skill to get there. You are such an incredible writer and producer and human, Andy Mangles, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of this with the ID8 community and inspiring and encouraging me personally and, and everyone who watches this. For all of our viewers, stay tuned and make sure you check out Andy's new upcoming work. Thank you very much, Mary, and thank you ID8 TV for, um, for, for doing this.